best way to distract the masses from what's really going on is to entertain them. It's just amazing to think what they did. What Roman corner would be complete about an obelisk going through an elephant? We've got the cross at the top and then we've got the elephant maybe carrying the obelisk or the obelisk is sprouted through. Thank you once again for joining me and welcome back to another one of my videos on the epic city that is Rome. Now this obelisk and an elephant is by our old friend Jean Lorenzo Benigni and it was completed in 1667. That's one year after the Great Fire of London. The elephant is carved from marble and is known affectionately as Il Puccino della Minerva. It was created to support the obelisk originally from the Temple of Isis in Rome. The obelisk dating back to the 6th century BC is inscribed with hieroglyphics praising the pharaoh Epris. This remarkable work stands in front of the church of Santa Maria Sofa Minera, seconds from the Pantheon. It blends Egyptian symbolism and Renaissance artistry, and I think symbolizes wisdom and strength. Benini's unique combination of ancient artifacts with the charmingly realistic animal sculpture makes this monument a notable and beloved landmark in Rome. What I love about wandering around Rome is it feels like a living museum. Every corner tells a story of its ancient past. One can encounter a myriad of ancient Roman ruins that speak volumes about the city's former glory. Everywhere you turn in this city, there's monuments and relics to the past. Some well preserved, some not so well preserved, as you can see, graffiti and rubbish, as you so rightly said. And then we get this guy. Who's this guy? Europa Parsi. Alecioni Lazio 2023. Hmm. Excrement. This is the monument to Victor Emmanuel II, also known as the Altar della Patria, the Altar of the Fatherland. It is one of the most iconic structures in Rome, and it is dedicated to Victor Emmanuel II. Now you might remember from my last video, the bridge that was also dedicated to the first king of unified Italy. He's had quite a few monuments dedicated to him, but this is probably the most grandest of all of them. It dominates the Piazza Venezia. It was designed by Giuseppe Sacconi. It was finally completed in the early 20th century with its inauguration in 1911 and its final completion in 1925. So we are literally coming up to 100 years of this amazing monument. Now this is a monument to the king, but also a monument to the soldiers of the First World War. What an impressive, the altar of the fatherland. I love the fact that they've got these large Italian flags up there. Almost kind of reminds me of the big flags that you see in Mexico City. I don't remember when I first came to Italy in the 90s seeing flags as large as this. But I could be wrong, maybe they've always been that way. But I think they were much smaller, or not even there. If you go to the top of this, there's an amazing viewing gallery, but it's going to cost you probably 25, 30 euros to get to the top of this. Now the monument is notable for its grandois design and size, making it one of the most recognizable landmarks in all of Rome. It is made of white marble from Botticino Brescia, as you can see, features some very majestic stairways. Corinthian columns, fountains, and equestrian sculpture of Victor Emmanuel II, and statues representing Italian regions and cities. As you can see, one side of the steps are taped off and there was a knock. The eternal flame is firing off in the distance. It makes you wonder, is the gas coming from Russia or is it coming from elsewhere? But it's beautiful. It really is beautiful. The fact that there's some soldiers guarding this over here, really poignant taking those that gave their lives for the freedoms of this country and really going to town with trying to remember the, those brave, brave men. 
One of the most significant elements of the monument is the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. Now, in Paris they have the Arc de Triomphe, and in London they have the Cenotaph. Rome has this. It has the eternal flame, symbolizing Italian state dedication to the fallen soldiers, especially those of World War I, whose bodies were never identified. As the sun sets on the monument, you can almost see the detail with the shadows. Some of it has been cleaned. You can see once it was very polluted, you can see the blackness, but they've attempted to clean it. And they've done a, to be honest, they've done a really good job of that. Wow, now I'm just blinded by the light as I try to go up the stairs. Critically, the monument has been subject to some controversy. Its construction involved the demolition of a large area of the Capontfilian Hill, including medieval and Renaissance structures. Additionally, its style and size have been seen by some as overly obnoxious and not harmoniously integrated with the surrounding urban landscape. see why so many choose to walk up these stairs. The higher we get, the better the view gets, and the more impressive the detail gets. The monument of Victor Emmanuel II remains an important symbol in Italy's national identity. Representing the unification of Italy and its historical journey, it attracts millions of visitors annually. Those that come to admire its architecture, its panoramic views of Rome, from the terraces and its historical significance as a testament to Italy's unification and its first king. And a bloody nice place to visit. The ancient ruins over there, we're going to be heading off into that direction. And then after that, you're going to see a site that, well, you're all going to recognize. As we get to the top, it's called the Piazza Bellatoni, and it commemorates the end of the bloody battle where the First World War was ending, and the Italians could claim victory. The end of the First World War, while we tinker on the edge. So, let's hope it doesn't happen, and let's hope what we see today will be seen in 2,000 years by, by future relatives who've become more impressive than us. to have an evening drink. You might have a glass of wine, you might have whatever you want. You've got a view of the Colosseum over here. A truly magnificent place. The seagulls seem to love it. If you'd like to go to the top where there's a viewing platform, it will cost you 15 euros. So I was slightly mistaken on the price. But it's a long, long, nice queue. But the view is good. You get right to the top, especially as the sun's setting. Worthy, worthy of your time if you want that romantic view. This might look like the Colosseum, but over here in the distance is the Marcel Colosseum. This actually predates the Colosseum. It was made for Julius Caesar. It's a theatre and it's more many things. And back down to the bottom for the sunsets. We're going to head in this direction. Obviously, if you've got a bit weak on your knees, or you've got, you can always take the bus tours. As you know, anyone watching my previous videos, all my videos, you'll never see them on those bus tours. But I understand why people take them. Some people are less mobile. It's one way to see a city. And at the end of the day, the tour guides that generally guide most bus tours are very well 
educated when it comes to what things to know. So if you want to pick up a little bit of local history, local knowledge, those guys, despite the silly prices sometimes, those guys are the right people to go to. Oh, they are very knowledgeable about all sorts of things. Some of the time at least. theory all of these zebra crossings cars should stop for you but just always be careful some drivers do not like stopping every minute counts and i don't stop for nothing that goes in any country not just italy to be honest what i found is the further east you go zebra crossings become a little bit obsolete this is the Fori in Paralali, or the Imperial Forums to the Anglosphere. It is a series of monumental public squares constructed over a century and a half by various emperors. These forums were the centre of political, religious and social life in ancient Rome, starting from the Campin di Gilio, a significant Renaissance square designed by Michelangelo, which sadly, for some reason, I skipped past. However, one can walk from the remnants of these forums, each bearing the name of the emperor who built it. What I love about this place, it's basically, a, you're living in a museum. It's an open museum. It's probably the best way to describe it. It's just amazing to think what they did, what these people did. What we do in life, echoes in eternity. You'll notice these pillars are very different to the ones of the Pantheon. The Pantheon's a solid granite, whereas these pillars are actually made of bricks. So, not quite as amazing, but still, it's, they've lasted. This path is like a journey through time, showcasing the evolution of the Roman architecture and the urban planning. Now, as we stroll down this historical route, the scenery will gradually transition from the Renaissance elegance that we saw back there to the grand ruins of ancient Rome. Continuing along this path, we will eventually reach the awe-inspiring Colosseum, the largest ancient amphitheatre ever built and a symbol of the architectural ingenuity of the Roman Empire. Ancient Roman tiles over here. Are they still there? Well, possibly would have been a kitchen. Roman tiles down here. Just, just in a museum or an archaeological site, however you'd like to. This remarkable work portrays Emperor Trajan in a moment of military life, raising his right hand to address his soldiers while his left hand holds a papyrus, symbolizing his role as legislator. The statue's significant lies in its dual representation of Trajan as both a military leader and a lawmaker, encapsulating his multifaceted reign. The statue is celebrated for its historical and artistic value and has been a popular model for replicas throughout the ages, this being one of them. It's the evening vibe, Saturday night, everyone's getting dressed to go out, or they are dressed to go out. Musicians are trying to earn a few extra pennies, a few extra euros. Probably got some statues over here, I'd imagine. When I say statues, people pretending to be statues. Yeah. It's a lot of effort, I think. Not quite as big as these ancient Roman statues, though, are they? Up ahead of us is the statue of Caesar Octavian Augustus. He was the first Roman emperor, and he stands as an iconic symbol of Roman art and history. Born Gaius Octavius, and later known as Octavian Augustus, he was adopted by Julius Caesar and became his successor after Caesar's assassination. Octavian Augustus played a pivotal role in transforming the Roman Republic into the Roman Empire, ushering in a period of relative peace and stability known as Pax Romana. 
Statues of Augustus often depict him in a manner that emphasizes his authority, leadership and divine status. They are typically characterized by a blend of realism and idealism, portraying him as a youthful, vigorous leader and often in military attire or in the likeness of a god, symbolizing his power and divine right to rule. These statues are not only a celebration of his political and military triumphs, but also showcase his artistic skill and creative vision of the Roman era. And I hope he will be celebrated for at least another 2,000 years. I could be wrong, but I remember back in the day this was possibly open to the public. I don't know. I just remember walking through ruins right next to the Colosseum when I was much younger. I think I'm mistaken, and I hope I am mistaken. Really nice vibe. Got all of the little musicians out. I like the cymbal and drum man over there. Gave him a few coins. Good man. The jazz playing over there. Rome's a very good city for jazz actually, so if you like jazz, I think that might be something I will probably be trying to find as the sun sets. You can see the sunset just over there behind the behind the bus. Before the sun sets, we're really we're heading over here. We're heading to the Are You Entertained? Are you not entertained? Are you not entertained? That's where we're heading. I do wonder if the walk on the way to the Colosseum is similar to the walk experienced by football fans all over the world and the fact that they, they might come out of the station or they might come out of their homes and then walk to the local stadium. The walk is always filled with people you know, selling scarves or selling knickknacks or sort of in this case selling paintings, spray can paintings there. They're obviously doing a bit of repairs here, trying to preserve what is left of the history here. But it does make me wonder is that people rocked up and they were being distracted by the emperors. They went to the Colosseum to be distracted. The best way to distract the masses from what's really going on is to entertain them. Fear and wonder, powerful combination. That's why in the modern world we have football. Football is the greatest distraction for the masses. It means the masses are no longer aware of what's going on around them, or what their parasitic leaders might be doing to them, what their parasitic leaders might be sucking the blood out of the country, sucking the blood out of their, the society that they know. But that's okay, because they're distracted. I think he knows what Rome is. In the modern world, they're distracted by football, they're distracted by rugby, sporting events, you name it, musicians. In the ancient times, they were distracted by throwing Christians to the lions, they were distracted by gladiator conflicts, they were just distracted by wars, battles being reenacted. 
Holmes, the mob. You'll conjure magic for them and they'll be distracted. You take away their freedom and still they'll roar. You name it, it happened here. But also ancient theatre happened here. Playwrights would have performed here with their actors. It wasn't just all blood sports. It wasn't... Musicians would have performed here as well. The beating heart of Rome is not the marble of the Senate. It's the sand of the Colosseum. If you can see past graffiti, we can see the prices have gone up. 16 euros now for a ticket to enter the Colosseum. Sadly, the ticket office is now closed because the sun is set and they've closed the... If you want to come, try to come here around about 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock. You probably will spend at least 60 to 90 minutes inside. Probably longer if you're really into the history. But I have to say, it's well worth the time. It's a phenomenal place to see. So if you want to get to the Colosseum, get the subway to Colosseo and then you come out straight outside the Colosseum. I think as the sun streams through the top windows of the Colosseum up here and we see that light is fading, it's probably quite poignant to maybe end this video. I think I'm going to be heading to a couple of bars, a couple of places to eat, and to be honest, I'm exhausted. I want to just check to see how many steps I've done so far. Remember, I didn't get in until 2.30 in the morning, and I was up at 8.30. Been out since. It is now, oh, it's only 5.30. Let's have a look at the steps. Not too many, I'm getting old, this is the problem. 25, 25,000 steps, that's pathetic. That is pathetic, but you know what, I'm going to be doing more steps later. But I just know that this battery is going to run out. I think it's a poignant time to sign off. So by the time the day finishes, I'm expecting his 35,000 steps, at least. I'll post the results in the uh, at the end of this video. Anyway, if you like this content, click that like button, click that subscribe button, and I will see you in the next video.